All of this is interesting information, and now we have a professor from Delaware who's going to talk about the very complex subject with detailed diagrams on bee genetics. And so please welcome Dr. Deborah Gidlaney. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad to see all your faces. This is a big room. Yeah, and I had a big breakfast. And I had a big iced tea. There's a lot of big things in Texas. And much bigger than Delaware, which is very tiny, has, you know. So I'm very happy to talk to you. I'm still kind of perplexed that, you know, you were scheduled, or I was scheduled to do genetics at 4.30, um, because even at an early hour, that can be kind of um, boring maybe for some. So I'm going to try to make it as exciting as possible. Um, so let's just get started and jump right into it. Hold on. OK, here we go. So what can genetics tell you? Well, it can tell you a lot of things especially if you kind of already have the beekeeping knowledge, which I'm assuming many of you here in the audience do. And so when you put these two things together, the understanding the basic genetics of a honeybee, a honeybee colony, and pair that with understanding colony behavior and management and growth, then you, it makes a whole lot more sense. Um, so basic biology, better management techniques, selecting for desirable traits, genetic heritage, also genetic diversity. These are all things that we're going to talk about in this lecture. And first I want to give you a quick background on DNA. How many of you are DNA buffs? Raise your hand. Awesome. Great. Well, hopefully then you will understand that there's two main types of DNA that I'm going to talk about today. There's mitochondrial DNA. And this is found in the cytoplasm of cells. I just like to say that word, cytoplasm. And it's circular. And I remember when I was first learning to extract, to actually remove this mitochondrial DNA, I was a beekeeper who became a scientist. And so they were like, it's circular. I'm like, like donuts? And they were like, yeah, kind of like donuts. And I'm like, okay, I'll get the donuts. Um, but it's maternally inherited. And why this is important is because you can actually trace the maternal ancestry of an organism by looking at their mitochondrial DNA. And so we do that with honeybees. And we can actually see where that maternal ancestor was from. I know you can actually send away for kits and look at your own maternal ancestry as human beings. And um, I actually was going to get the primers because I could do that in my own lab for really cheap. Uh, but I haven't done it yet. I only do it for honeybees. But we're also going to talk about nuclear DNA because nuclear DNA is found in the nucleus of living cells. It's double-stranded chromosomes, kind of your typical poster child for DNA, uh, this double helix. And what makes it different from mitochondrial DNA and another useful tool for understanding honeybees is the fact that it's inherited from both parents. It's not just inherited from the mother or the queen. It's inherited from the queen and the drone if we're going to talk about honeybees. Now, this is a diagram that I, I do like quite a bit. And it's basically showing you the difference in terms of um, heritability of different types of traits. Um, so if we look at this uh, diagram here, I'm going to use this side. Whoop, wait. Oh, pointer. It's, uh, oh, does that work? No. It doesn't show. But this first son, nuclear DNA is inherited from all ancestors. You can see it's a man and a woman in this particular example that is, yeah, I did that. Oh, there we go. Um, and so they're sharing their genes and passing it on to their offspring as you're going down. Here, mitochondrial DNA is only inherited from the single lineage, this being the female. And so this is really important to understanding how we use these two different molecules in honeybees to understand more about, about those honeybee populations. 
Now, this is that same diagram, but now we see bees. Um, and so you can see here, this is nuclear DNA. It's inherited from all ancestors. So we have the drone and the queen represented. And we go down through, and you can see how traits are kind of being passed along from generation to generation. Here, on this side, this is the mitochondrial DNA. And you can see here that this is just passed down through the queen. So what the workers all are going to have the mitochondrial DNA or maternal ancestry representative of their queen. That's representative of that queen of the, and the queen prior. And so this is a really cool tool for us to be able to utilize when we're trying to understand the background of a particular honeybee colony or a queen. So if we go back to the basics, if we think about chromosomes, and we're going to be thinking about them today in honeybees, what we can see here is that female honeybees have 32 chromosomes, 16 pairs. And these chromosomes contain genetic information, genetic information that make these bees behave certain ways, look certain ways, do certain things. But one pair of those are sex chromosomes. And what that means is that they're going to be involved in determining the sex of that bee. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. So these are these sex loci on these sex chromosomes, okay? And you can see here one is red and one is blue. And for the simple purposes of today, this is because we see that they're different. They're, they're two different sex lo, 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 uh, loci right there. If we look at the cast and sex genetics across the different cast members of a honeybee colony, we see the queen, she has these 32 chromosomes or 16 pairs, one of which are these sex chromosomes. You can see the sex lo locus there. Then we have a drone. Male honeybees typically are haploid, meaning they only have 16 chromosomes. They don't have two pairs. So therefore, they only have one sex locus. The workers are just like the female. I mean the queen, because they are female, excuse me. They have 32 chromosomes or 16 pairs, two of which are sex chromosomes. So just take that all in. There's nothing really but to learn that right now. Yes? Well, we'll talk about it, okay? Let's talk about it. I said typically for a region, re, a region, a reason, and we'll talk about why in, in a couple slides. But if we look at the mating genetics here, what you see here is this queen honeybee, and those are her two sex chromosomes there. What this represents is a blow up of her spermatheca, which is a sperm storage organ inside the queen honeybee. So when she goes on multiple kind of mating bouts, right, um, she stores the sperm from different drone dads in her spermatheca. And so this is the drone comet here, and each of these are their single sex chromosomes, right? And so those are then now represented in her spermatheca. These, when she actually chooses to release sperm and fertilize the eggs that she lays, will lead to a bunch of different subfamilies or patrilines in the colony, meaning that the workers all don't share the same dad, right? Which is really awesome, if you think about it. It's very complex. If we look at colony genetics here, if we see now, OK, this once virgin now goes back to the hive, and she's mated, and she starts to lay. What are we going to see with her workers? Well, these are possibilities here. And what you can see in this very simplified example, if she were to donate one of her sex chromosomes to one of the ones contributed by that very lucky drone, um, then these are the different results of workers that she could produce. And what this represents is this particular patriline, another patriline there. They share the same dad. That first one shares the same dad. Uh, there's a third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, and a sixth. Of course, this is a very simplified version for this particular talk. But now you can see that if we were to go to a honeybee colony, take a sample of bees, say 100, and look at their genetics, we can actually determine how many drones that particular queen mated with based on the number of patrilines we see in the colony. 
Therefore, we can determine how well mated that queen was, how genetically diverse that particular colony is. And this will be important later on when we look at studies that have shown the importance of intra-colony diversity on the health and longevity of honeybee colonies. Now, if we look at sex determination, and now I'm getting to your question, sir. Um, you can see here in this particular example, we have a queen. There are her, her sex chromosomes right there with the sex loci. And if she were to actually go out on a date with this lovely, lovely drone, um, you can see here what would happen is a couple of different scenarios. If we, she were to choose not to fertilize the eggs, which means she's not going to release sperm from her spermatheca, she's simply going to lay the egg unfertilized, she, this will result in one drone that has this sex chromosome, or it could be this drone that has this other sex chromosome version. If she chooses to fertilize her eggs, the possible outcomes are shown right here. So if she donates one of her blue to his blue, then what you're going to have is a diploid drone. This is a drone that has 32 chromosomes, that has 16 pairs, but they're the same at the sex locus. So what this means is that it's not going to be viable. This is a non-viable drone. It's possible, but they're not going to survive. And they actually, there's cues that they release, chemical cues, that alerts other bees in the colony to know that they're not quite right. They're not viable. Don't waste your time on those. And actually, they will be chewed out as larvae or pupae in the hive. And that's what we used to call a shotgun brood pattern, um, and some of us still do, but now it's a little harder to decipher from this VSH trait and these other things where you have holes in your brood. But this was a sign of inbreeding, typically, when you had this shoddy brood because the males, the drones, were diploid because they were closely or more closely related to the queen because they shared the same sex locus. Now, the other result, though, is that she could donate her blue, or her red, excuse me, to his blue. Therefore, you would have a completely viable diploid worker. Okay? So those are the possibilities there. If we look at this next example here, okay, so now this queen, um, maybe she goes to a different drone congregation area. She didn't go to the, you know, this one that was close by or whatever. If she were to meet this drone who has a very handsome green sex chromosome, any possible outcome would result in either if she chooses to not fertilize them again, she would have these two different drones representing different sex chromosomes, or she chooses to fertilize them, then no matter what she contributes, it's going to result in diploid viable worker females because they are not going to be the same at the sex locus. She, there, there's no relationship there. They don't share the same genetics in the sex locus. So this is the sex determination system in honeybees. It's called haplodiploidy. And not just honeybees have this type of sex determination, where the way they determine sex is by if they are similar at the sex locus or different at the sex locus. Ants, wasps, all hymenoptera are haplodiploid. This is something unique to that particular order of insects. Now, this is just a recap. We call it haplodiploidy. Viable drones come from unfertilized eggs, females from fertilized eggs. If we were to take that a step further, if an egg is heterozygous or different at the sex loci, it becomes a female. If an egg is homozygous at the sex loci, the individual will become a diploid drone and be eaten and rendered not happening, dead. If the egg is unfertilized, therefore haploid, the individual will become a viable haploid drone. So kind of interesting, and why this is important for us to know is it makes a lot of sense when we look inside a colony, and I'll tell you why. So why should I care about all this? Well, if you have a drone layer, what could that mean? You can raise your hand. Participation is definitely enjoyed by me. An unmated queen. You could have a virgin. Absolutely. What else could it mean? She, it, she ran out. 
She ran out. You could have a laying worker. Let's not talk about that. That's going to put me in a bad mood. Um, <coughs> excuse me. What else? Okay, she maybe only mated with a very closely related drone. So there's a lot of inbreeding going on. But then you might not even get anything, right? Or she, her reproductive tract could be damaged in some way, right? There could be a problem where she can't release eggs to fertilize. So just by understanding kind of haplodiploidy, now you're starting to understand what could be the possible problems for different things you might see inside your hive if your colony goes drony, right? Um, of course, there's a way to see if it's a virgin or not. It's destructive and probably costs you some money, but you can dissect out her spermatheca and see if it's clear, like this particular one here, or if it's mated. A mated one, of course, will have a spermatheca with a tracheal net surrounding it. That's that kind of fibrous covering that is awesome. It supplies oxygen and nutrients to those developing, it sustains those sperm inside of there for years. I mean, that's just crazy. Every time I say that, that's just crazy to me that they have this spermatheca, this little orb inside their body that has this breathing kind of nutrient supplying net around it that keeps the sperm viable for years. It's crazy, isn't it? Or am I just freaking out over nothing? Okay, so why should I care about all this? Why might some queens get superseded? Huh, excuse me? Poor layers. The queen runs out of sperm. All of the same reasons that we talked about. S low pheromone, yep, sure, but that could also be related to the fact that she's getting older and doesn't have as many eggs. Um, or, so all of these things are interrelated. Now, what is responsible for colony behavior or traits? Well, the queen is very important. She is the mother of all members. She uses chemical control to keep daughters in check. All phenotypes and inherited traits come from her, and she and her daughters control the sex ratio of the hive. She's pretty awesome and very, very important. And what else is responsible for colony behavior and traits? Environmental factors. The same bees that if you had sister bees, okay, that you, you artificially inseminated so you controlled both sides of the equation, in terms of how you produce that queen. And you put one in a desert environment and one, say, up in, at the University of Delaware. You would have bees that behaved very differently from one another because they are responding to environmental cues. And that's because honeybees, this being a worker right here, this being a drone right here, have highly technical sensory equipment. And they have to. They have to because they are these little tiny things in this huge, huge universe that need to be able to take in environmental cues, changes in temperature, relative humidity, that maybe are changes of maybe less than 1%. But that 1% could mean the life or death of them. They have to be able to capture chemical information in terms of pheromones that are being released so that they know how to perform in the hive and what needs to be done. There's feedback loops between outside environment, nectar production, egg laying, pollen coming in, and all of that is a feedback loop to pheromones that are released in order to cause different behaviors inside the hive. And, oh, I didn't say, what's really cool about this, and this is where I go into my uh, Little Red Riding Hood kind of thing, right? Directly, their structure explains their function. You see this drone, his whole head is eyeballs. His, his antennae are big and thick, and it's the better to see you with, the better to smell you with, right? And that's because he needs to go find a queen so that he can get his genetics into the future generations. So I bring this up because this directly relates to what we've been doing with honeybees for years and years and decades and decades is selecting for desirable traits. Breeding. Breeding for things we want to see in our honeybee colonies. Breeding for ways that we can make honeybees economically viable for us, maybe. 
or just enjoyable for us. And so breeding and trait selection, tra differences in behaviors and traits is genetic variation. It is the definition of genetic diversity. And this is the raw material for selection. If there is no diversity, then you can't select for a specific trait if everything is the same. To have differences in behavior and traits is how we realize, oh, that one's better than that one. That one's darker than that one. That one's nicer than that one. That one makes more honey than that one. So it's these differences, this variability that allows us to hone in on particular things that we want to see in our operation. Now, I give a lot of props to Gilbert Doolittle, not only because he like has style. I mean, look at that outfit. I would totally rock that outfit in my apiary. But he really was the first to understand this idea of selecting a good queen and then making more of her. I really like the way this one performs. Oh, I can make more of her. I really can just take these young worker larvae from this queen that I like, use artificial queen cups, royal jelly, whatever, use these artificial cups, and then raise more of her. He is the father, founder of commercial queen rearing. And he really kind of spurred our commercial queen rearing industry here in the United States. Our queen stock industry is founded on the identification of colonies with desirable traits. The selection of queen and drone mothers with desirable traits. And yes, you have to select your drone colonies too. You want your drones to be the best they can be. We also select for disease resistance. There's tons of great programs and examples of people doing the hard work, selecting for traits. And it's hard work because as soon as you select for a particular trait that you like, you're deselecting something else that you probably don't even know about because you're increasing the presence of that particular trait or behavior, then something else has got to give and got to go. And it's very hard when you're trying to maintain this genetic diversity, yet you want to select down on a particular traits. It's a very tricky business, so I give props to all the breeders, not even just honeybee breeders. But disease resistance, behavioral, physiological kind of behaviors and traits, as well as hygienic behavior, we'll talk about some more of these. Different things that have been selected for, for stock improvement. You've heard of varroa sensitive hygiene, um, SMR, all these different kind of hygienic types of behavior. You've seen probably um, these bees kind of looking and doing this hygienic kind of behavior where they're uncapping pupae. These are, these are capped at this point. This You can see here, it's a purple kind of maroon-eyed pupil stage here. So they've uncapped that because they've cued in on the chemicals that are being released, that there's something wrong. So they are take that particular bee out. And of course, many of you, how many of you do um, the hygienic testing with liquid nitrogen to look at the hygienic behavior of your bees? Well, here's an example here. So you kind of take a can, you smush it into the brood, you pour liquid nitrogen into that can, it kills just that circle of brood. 24 hours later, you go back, you count how many cells have been removed. 48 hours, you go back. So you can see this example here, these bees are not very hygienic, right? Nothing's really been removed there. These ones are rock stars. But who knows? Maybe they just don't like any bees. You know, maybe they're just going to remove everything. Who knows what their threshold is? No, I'm just joking. Anyway. If we look, too, this is a really cool picture. This was actually from the bottom boards of some hives when I was in England. And they were really interested in kind of looking and dissecting out the remnants on bottom boards and on sticky boards. And what they were finding were tons of pupil parts. So obviously, this VSH trait is kind of there because um, we see all these pupil, here's pupil antennae, et cetera. Also, mites with big bite marks in them. So, quite interesting. So, stock improvement is using improved stocks of bees in an effective way to improve the productivity of a beekeeping operation, simply. And it's been, it's been going on for a very long time. So, what else can we learn from studying the genetics? How does selective breeding translate to colony health? 
where's the connection there? Well, there's been numerous studies, and I'm just highlighting a few here, that have kind of shown that connection. That high diversity at the colony level, meaning that that queen was promiscuous and she's mated with lots of good different drones that aren't related, means that bees can actually dance more efficiently, foragers are more um, efficient at their dance, as well as the receiving other bees are actually more efficient in interpreting the dance. There's been studies that actually show that more diverse bees have more of a genetic toolkit and behaviors to deal with mites, pathogens, and et cetera, things that might hurt that colony. There's also been really cool research that shows that this goes internally into the microbiome of a bee's gut, where colonies that are more diverse, meaning that the queen is mated with more drones, so there's more genetic, related, different patch lines in the colony, actually have more beneficial microbial bacteria or microbes in their gut than colonies that are, just have a queen who was artificially inseminated with one drone. So there's really cool work here showing the importance of diversity at the colony level. So how diverse are our bees? I'm just giving you a small snapshot into some work that I was involved with when I talk about some of the larger trends here in some of the bees that I've studied. Now, it's really important for us to understand why we kind of got on this diversity kick in the first place. Why do we care? Why did we ever care? Well, if we look at the history of honeybee importation, most books, and I'm sure some of you have read Tammy Horn's book, Bees in America, some of you out there, they, some of the first entries were found from ship logs, and they found that there were Apis mellifera, that's honeybee colonies, your western honeybee, in the bottom of ships that were being transported over in the 1600s. Now, this was from the Virginia Company. That's one of these first records. But this is the dark bee of Western Europe, which we know as Apis mellifera mellifera. So this is a subspecies designation because it has that Apis is the genus, Mellifera is a species, and then a second mellifera would be the subspecies name. It's a trinomial, meaning that it is a particular strain of Apis mellifera. Now, what's really cool about this, and there's actually been some other work that suggests that maybe bees were brought up in the 1500s from New Spain by missionaries, so there's lots of things to think about, but they didn't understand the pollination connection. This was in the 1600s. Pollination wasn't fully understood. That means that honeybees weren't understood as the mediator who move pollen from plant to plant that causes pollination and fertilization until the mid 1700s. So they were bringing bees to the US for reasons of products that the, these bees could supply their farm and their family. So the history of honeybee importation after that well, there was additional introductions that occurred about 200 years after the arrival of that initial Apis mellifera mellifera, the dark German bee. But that wasn't until 1859, and it stopped promptly in 1922 because there was the scare of the Isle of Wight disease, and they didn't want to keep bringing bees into the U.S., so there was a ban to bring any additional germplasm or stock into the United States. But however, in between that time, seven additional subspecies were introduced into North America. And this really changed how things were. It wasn't just to kind of produce honey and wax and things for the farm and for the family and maybe to barter and sell. This grew the occupation of beekeeping. A beekeeping industry started to form where there were skep makers. They were starting to try different types of hive designs or, or containers or cavities to keep bees. So provision of nest cavities, expansion of the range, because honeybees are not native to North America. Selection for favorable traits started to occur. Managing for honey, they were actively seeking subspecies or bees that had traits desirable that would work here in the United States. So species of Apis mellifera, I like to think of Apis mellifera, this is the range. This is the native range of our beloved honeybee, okay? It's huge. That is a huge range. 
And I like to think about this as we can break this huge area, this vast area, into different neighborhoods, okay? And those neighborhoods can represent honeybee subspecies. Apis mellifera mellifera is one of those neighborhoods. They just happen to be up in Germany. And the reason we break them into neighborhoods is because the bees in this vast range are experiencing different climates, different forage, a whole different type of environment. So over time, they started to look different. They started to behave different, to utilize the environment different. However, they still can interbreed if they are near one another. So they're not different species, but they're different enough that we can call them subspecies. So there's over two dozen subspecies, and we can actually break these subspecies into different kind of evolutionary lineages or kind of these morphological groupings. We have the M lineage, which contains Apis mellifera mellifera, the C lineage, which there's quite a few in there, but ones that you'll probably be familiar with is Apis mellifera lagustica, the Italian honeybees, and Apis mellifera carnica, the carniolan honeybees. And then we have the A lineage, which hosts a whole bunch of different African subspecies. Now, subspecies designation has been kind of verified by looking at morphological differences as well as looking at molecular differences. So we can take a bunch of bees from all different places and measure the length of their proboscis, measure their wing angles, measure their different coloration, the length of their thorax, put all of these variables together that are based on how they look, morphological characteristics, and they will branch out into different subspecies. That's awesome. So you can see that their environment directly affected the way they look. But what we also found out is that we can actually look at those molecular, those molecules that I talked about, mitochondrial DNA, nuclear DNA, and they branch out into different subspecies based on their molecular makeup as well. So we can use these different tools to understand what, how related our bees are or where they maybe originally came from. So these are the subspecies that were brought into North America. You can see the subspecies here, Malif uh, Apis mellifera mellifera, Apis mellifera ligustica, Lamarckii, Carnica, Cypria syriaca, Caucasica, Intermissa, and Scutellata. And then you can see the origin, where they're native to, and then the approximate arrival date of when we know they were present in North America. And then that lineage that I talked about, so kind of how they group together, morphologically as well as molecular, molecularly, that's a weird word. All right, so these ones that I just starred are ones that I would say we derived our kind of breeding stock from. If you look in the magazines, a lot of people say they're selling Carniolans or Italians or Caucasians. And it's changed, and there's been different ones over the years, but these are pretty common. Now, if we look at populations of U.S. honeybees, we can see that commercial populations really are managed by queen breeders. They are selecting, they're doing that hard work, that careful work of monitoring colonies and selecting and grading them based on traits that they want. And then they sell us daughter queens from their breeder queens. And for the longest time, really, there was kind of a western commercial population and a southeastern commercial population. And still, we still have a lot of big breeders in those two kind of geographic areas. But beekeeping and queen rearing has become very popular, so we have a lot more smaller breeders popping up as well. There's also populations of U.S. honeybees that were definitely prevalent uh, before the early 1990s, before Varroa kind of was, became established, that weren't managed, that weren't kind of tended or controlled by beekeepers in terms of their genetics. And we call these feral honeybee populations. Now, there's different factors that you would think about that could possibly affect the diversity of bees in the United States and affect these two different types of populations. First off being the fact that we only introduced a small number of the true diversity of bees from their native range, that vast range I showed you. We only brought over a little samplings. 
And so this is an example of a founder event. You can see here in that vast range, there's that initial population. Well, we only sampled a small little bit of it and brought it across the ocean and then basically started our honeybee population from that smaller kind of sampling. This is called a bottleneck. This is a founder event. So this new population is going to be narrower genetically. Also, we've had a really annoying pest. <laughs> a really annoying pest that, thank goodness, isn't that big, though I kind of really would like to have that giant one in my house. I, I'm going to try to replicate that. Anyway, that really caused a significant reduction in the bees that were present here in North America and still are causing a lot of issues and problems and the viruses associated with them. But this is not a virus talk, so I'm not talking about it. Also, the use of a small number of queen mothers to produce annual replacements for a lot of people who need bees. It's harder and harder to find the queens that you want, that you need when you need them to get good nukes, to get good packages. And our queen breeding method, which thanks to Gilbert M. Doolittle is awesome, but at the same time, it reduces the amount of variability because you are making many daughters from one queen. So we looked at these numbers, and these are old at this point, but I know that Steve Shepard, who I did this work with, his student recently has redone some of this, so we should get some new numbers out there soon. But we looked at the southern commercial breeding population and the western commercial breeding population from 1993 and 1994. So commercial queen breeders in these two areas were sampled. And we asked them questions, we kept it all anonymous, about how many breeder queens they used and then how many daughter queens they made from those breeders. And this is what the numbers came out to from that sampling. They used 603 queen mothers to produce 890 1,700 daughters during that time period. And these are the ones that we talked to. We didn't, I'm sure, get to everybody, but we got to quite a few and a lot of the big ones. And so this wasn't that, ev there were some people that used a few queen mothers to produce tons, and there were some that used a lot of queen mothers and didn't, and, and it was okay. It was across the board. Now, we did, we did this in 2004 and 2005, and again, we see even a, a, a reduction of the number of queen mothers used. So this would be really interesting to do again, now that we have more breeders and things have changed with, with this establishment of Varroa. How, what is it like now? But this is a little bit alarming. Now, if we looked and tracked the maternal ancestry of these queen mothers that were used during this time, let's see what we can see in terms of diversity of mitochondrial DNA, mother origin, so to speak. You can see here, this is the Western commercial breeders from 1994 and 2004, and this is a pie chart showing the Southern commercial breeders from 1993 and 2005. And what I want you to see here is that most of what they are vending, the queen mothers that they're making queen daughters from, are from the C lineage, which contains Lagustica and Carnica, which they tell you you're buying. That's what they're buying. What's interesting, though, is over that period, both of them have kind of lost a few tiny, tiny slices in the pie. And these are representative of mainly down in the southern commercial breeding area, Apis mellifera mellifera, or the M lineage. And some different lineages here uh, in the C um, lineage group up in the western commercial breeding population. So who cares? Why do we care? I just think it's cool. I want to share it with you all. Uh, but if we look at the results from the mamas and the papas, because I just showed you the mamas there, and we look at nuclear DNA. Now let's track the relatedness of colonies. How closely related are our colonies? How closely related are different populations of honeybees? Honeybees from the West Coast versus honeybees from the East Coast? Or the two breeding groups? Well, what we found is that the Western commercial breeding population and the Southern commercial breeding population, when we did this study, in 1993, you can see these are the southern commercial breeding populations. These are the western commercial breeding populations. They're genetically different from each other. So we can learn that from looking at the nuclear DNA, which is interesting. 
So we also had about 700 nests that were sampled between 1981 and 1991. And they were in the freezer. They were labeled from different places. We had all the notes of where they found them and what caves and what places. And so these were feral colonies. <clears throat> and we decided to look at their mitochondrial DNA as well. And what you can see here is that there's a lot more diversity to this pie. You see a much stronger influence of Apis mellifera mellifera. And this is really interesting because these are coexisting with the commercial population, yet their mitochondrial kind of integrity is different and has been maintained. So this suggests that there must be some barriers to these two different kind of populations of bees mixing. And it's kind of interesting here too. You can kind of see there's also Apis mellifera lamarckii. Very interesting bee from the um, Nile Delta Valley region that was brought in in the mid 1800s. And we're still seeing remnants of it in the mitochondrial DNA. Really cool. So when we looked at the mamas and the papas, so the nuclear DNA, what we found is that commercial and feral populations have a different genetic structure. And that was really exciting. And that kind of spurred me to kind of look more closely at feral populations. And what are feral populations? Do feral populations still exist? What are all these unmanaged bees? Oh, that's been up in that church tower, you know, for 50 years. Well, has it? Or is it just an escaped swarm that each year an escaped swarm goes in and then it dies off from a commercial colony? I, I, that was, I was curious. What were these bees in these different places, in these bee trees? There was lots of talk that the feral population was completely decimated. But when you went really into the literature in the early 2000s that talked about this, they were based off of very small areas in California, maybe an island, et cetera. So there was no real good kind of study that really tried to look at what these unmanaged bees we now see are or where they're from. Or they're the remnants of this old feral population that hit before Varroa. So we decided to do the feral bee project, where we had people, anybody who knew of an unmanaged bee nest would contact me or upload it onto this website, Save the Hives. And from that, I would go in my little, I felt like, um, what's that, Scooby-Doo? I had a van, I had like collecting material on top. We would go and take samples. And then I'd bring them back and I'd look at their genetics. Now what I'm showing you here, this is really interesting, is this diagram right here is based on wing angles, which is a really common way to do morphological kind of analysis to see what subspecies a bee is. And so we had um, Dr. Jajung from Brazil do this, and he compared these, these blue bees here are all the unmanaged and managed bees we collected during this project. He compared these to the true subspecies types of mellifera and caucasica and carnica and lagustica. And so you can see here that these unmanaged bees and these bees from North Carolina separate out from the subspecies that they were originally derived from. So really, if you think about it, our bees have been interbreeding for so long that a lot of what we have is kind of like mutts. And they're very kind of homogeneously diverse. They all have a lot of diversity because they all have been interbreeding for so long. So I think that's very, very interesting. Now we wanted to look further at some of these natural populations in the ads. When you think about a natural honeybee population, what comes to your mind? Somebody just say it. A tree. How many trees? Bunches of trees. Oh, over how big of an area? Two or three trees per 10 acres or so. Psh, you're a lot better than I. I couldn't, I couldn't even wrap my head around it when I first started. I'm like, what is a natural honeybee population? Like, how, how many bees would just, if we weren't here kind of messing everything up all the time, 
How many bees would just be in the wild? Right, in the United States, none. But still, like now that they, they've been here for a while, so we can just put that to rest, mister. Okay? <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Um, but yes, trees. And so I was really interested, what is a natural population of honeybees? How dense are they? Like, what would that look like? How, how often do they supersede? How often do they swarm? I wanted to know what they do without us kind of meddling in. And so, luckily, Tom Seeley has been following bees in the Arnott Forest since the 70s. And he's taken awesome accounts and mapped these bee trees. And so, I was lucky enough to get his interest because he doesn't really like to do the genetics. And I don't really know how to beeline, even though I did it with him for a couple days. And we teamed up, and here is a picture of one of his students and there's the bee nest. You wonder why we don't know, because we walk right underneath it. I would, I would, that would be really hard to find, right, in this dense forest. So this is how he does it if you don't know. He has this awesome little paint set. He kind of sets it out. And this takes a while to hone in on the location of a bee tree. Oh. Oh, I went too far. Hold on. So the Arnott Forest, if you're not familiar with it, is this forest that's about 16.5 square kilometers, but it's also surrounded after that by state forests. So he's been tracking colonies in this forest 1978, did it again in 2002, and then most recently he did it in 2012. He also looked this last time for any managed bees that might be near that forest. He found only two apiaries, and we sampled those as well. One of them was apiary one, we'll call it, 0.5 miles away. And one was apiary two, 2.5 file, 2 miles away. So we sampled all of the hives from all of those. And we also sampled all, he resampled all of the bee trees he could find that year. And you can see them here. So this is a map of the two apiaries. These are all the bee trees here. You can see them, little cute trees. And what he did was give me these samples, and then I looked at their genetics. Because he really wanted to see, are these, are not bees different genetically? Are they unique? So what we found, if we look here, this is just one of many analyses, um, where we found that looking at their genetics, this is the nuclear DNA now from the mother, or the drone and the queen. Apiary one is represented as white squares, Tree bees, or the are not bees, are represented as yellow squares, and apiary two is represented as blue squares. They do separate out based on their genetics. Also, if we look at other levels or proxies for differences in, in genetic diversity, what we find is that the tree bees, compared to apiary one and apiary two, all of them have basically statistically similar levels of diversity genetic diversity. But what's interesting and what is significantly different is that these private alleles, these are unique alleles, unique genes, were significantly higher in the Arnott Forest or the tree bees. If we looked at some other tests that kind of show the genetic differentiation of Arnott bees, the tree bees from the two apiaries, we also see that these figures suggest that they are significantly different from each other genetically. And finally, the last study we did was looking at estimates of queen mating frequency. So we actually took samples and genotyped workers from the tree bees and compared that to workers from these managed apiaries. Because we wanted to see, do, do these Bees that aren't, you know, kind of managed by us, how many mates do those queens mate with? How many drones? We wanted to see if there was differences in the diversity. And we found none. We found no difference. They all mate with the same amount of drones, more or less. So they're, the bees in the forest, they're not drone limited, but they also aren't, I can't, I don't even know how to say this without being inappropriate. 
<laughs> they also don't uh, mate with a lot more than, <laughs> than what we see in you know, commercial settings. So that is the end. You've been a very, very good audience. I hope I didn't bore you. I hope that I made it understandable. I don't know if I have time for questions, but I also wanted to show with you, share with you my new favorite insect, besides honeybees, of course. This is the rosy maple moth. Isn't she cute? Oh my gosh. <laughs> the rosy maple moth. My friend, she raises them. That picture's not from her, but she raises them, and that's how I found out about them. But they're native to North America. Yes? Great. Oh, lovely. It, I wonder how much you've done in the sorting of the reason why they stay diverse or separated is because, like, the queens might mate with the drones of these other colonies, but maybe they don't accept them or, you know, because they tend to prefer e their own relatedness, correct? And so what I notice is here in Texas, I've bought queens from Hawaii and California and New Mexico and up in the Northeast, and that, none of the hives live here. I mean, I can keep them alive for a while, but I don't have good luck raising queens from other places, but I have great luck raising queens, or using queens from here. And so I wonder how much of them staying separate is due to them not you know, killing off the queen that they didn't like and raising their own sister queen or something. Excellent question. Excellent observation. <laughs> no. What we, what we suspect, and this is based off other studies in the native range, where we do see true ecotypes. I mean, if you think about it, in terms of evolutionary time, we've, it's just been a blip here that we've had bees, right? And so kind of this local adaptation, hopefully it's occurring, but we move bees all over the place all the time, so we kind of mess any a lot of things up in that realm. But if we look at bees over in France, where they have this special ecotone of bees, the Leyland bees that, that forage on heather, those bees actually were compared to other bees that were brought in, commercial bees. And what they found is that they were genetically distinct, and they were able to maintain that genetic distinction because in that case, they used drone congregation areas and produced drones earlier. So there was a sexual separation or isolation between the populations. There's been some speculation that Apis mellifera mellifera, being from a colder climate, more north, maybe also before Varroa hit and where we really saw still their presence, also used drone congregation areas earlier and produced drones earlier. But nobody really looked at that. That's just kind of speculation, but there's also other possibilities of things that could happen for sure in terms of maybe they just don't like them. Maybe they are giving off different types of cues, chemical cues. And so I think that's a really cool area to focus in on, but I haven't solved it, no. I just got back from Ireland and they said that they have a native black bee there, Apis mellifera mellifera, the original, or their original Irish black bee. And I was over there and I kept going, you mean the little black German bee? And they kept saying, no, 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 the black Irish native bee. What do you think about that? Oh my gosh, you're not taping this, are you? No, <laughs> no. Uh, oh, I, every, it, when I was in Scotland, when I was in Ireland, I hear of the Scot dark little Scotland native bee. And so, I mean, <laughs> and so I haven't seen them, but I definitely would love to get my, I always say, give me some and I'll look at them. You know, um, but sure. I mean, even when I was in North Carolina and South Carolina, the swamp bees. You know, they're known these little dark black swamp bees, which are probably have isolated over time and just gone into the swamp areas and were, have been able to maintain. Um, so there's a whole host of interesting things out there. Um, but until I look at them, I don't know what to tell you. I heard something swarm when they're unassisted by beekeepers. Yeah. 
Hold on a second. I still didn't fully hear it. The question is, when unassisted by beekeepers to do splits, have you observed how frequently they, that feral colonies swarm? That's a great question. And only a few instances, not enough to give you any general trend. Um, and, and, you know, I've definitely seen bee trees that I've tracked for a while and how much they swarm. And they swarm a lot. How, what I haven't done is to be able to track those swarms. And because that's really would be interesting. That's like the longevity of those bees, right? I mean, what's awesome about bees is that they reproduce at the colony level. That's what swarming is. Um, but it would be awesome to be able to kind of track the longevity of their swarming, you know. But no, that's, that, that would be really neat. And I don't have a good answer for you. Oh. Coming. So when you uh, did this, when they when you collected this data on the number of commercial bees, queen mothers, number of issues that they were, and you had it for a couple of years, did at the same time you have any kind of idea as to how many drone hives they were selecting to complement this, let's say, 900 commercial queen mother hives? That's a great question. No, that we didn't have any data on how many drone hives they were using. When we were looking in 2002 and 2004, there were definitely some breeders that were using drone source colonies, but not a whole lot. That wasn't a real common thing then. That they they weren't really. They were just thinking they were just being supplied because there's so many bees in the area. Um, so really once like 2005, 2006, when there was really noticeable problems where queen breeders were like, what is going on? And we started looking at drones and we started looking at their sperm and are they viable and what's going on? That's when you really started to see the shift and really people, I think, more understood the importance of selecting drone colonies as well. But we didn't take that data, so we don't know how many actually used that then. I believe we as beekeepers would be willing to pay hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars, for a bee that lived five years, produced prodigious amounts of honey, offspring, all of the traits that we're trying to select for. In five minutes or less, tell us why we don't have that bee today. Why can't we make that bee? Because it's not an economic issue. Um, well, money can't buy you everything. <laughs> Um, and like I said, it's breeding is hard. When you select for particular traits, you have no control over what you're deselecting. Um, I would love that too. That would be awesome. And I think w genetics obviously can solve some problems, but it's not a permanent solution. You constantly have to be on top of it, adding new genes in, which is diluting the genes you selected for. So it's just a lot tougher than, than that. It's not a good answer, sorry. <laughs>